Hello, Columbia. I'm your Councilwoman, Tamika Isaac Devine. Thanks for joining us here at the City of Columbia as we hold the 2020 Mayor's Walk Against Domestic Violence. Unfortunately, we are unable to be together in person due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but our efforts to bring awareness towards domestic violence are not wavering. I'd like to thank all of you who registered this year for this year's virtual walk and your support to end the domestic violence in our community. In fact, right now it's more important than ever for us to bring light to the issue and support victims of domestic violence. Because we are in isolation due to this global pandemic, some victims of domestic violence are facing unique circumstances where they cannot escape their abusers. According to research done by the National Domestic Violence Hotline, during the first few months of the pandemic, they experienced a 9% increase in the contact volume and a 10% of those calls cited COVID-19 as a contributing factor. Because of isolation and social distancing protocols, some abusers are taking advantage of an already stressful situation. For example, abusers have been reported using COVID-19 as a scare tactic so that victims would not see their kids, family, or close friends as well as holding important medical information about the virus. It is important to note that other situations that are being intensified because of this global pandemic could also play a factor in domestic violence cases, including financial constraints, alcohol abuse, and the inability to get to a safe place. I am so proud of all the work already being done in our city to combat domestic violence, including our Columbia Police Department under the leadership of Chief Skip Holbrook. The department takes matters of domestic violence very seriously and not only work to arrest those perpetrators of domestic violence, but also helps to establish a support line for victims to overcome their abusive situations. I'm also proud of all of our local partners like the Sister Care and the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Sister Care is an amazing resource in the Midlands as they provide services and advocacy to victims of domestic violence and their children. In fact, Sister Care is busier than ever due to the pandemic and has experienced an 85% increase in calls to the crisis line during the last three months compared to last year. The South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, better known as SCADVASA, has been the statewide advocacy leader since 1981. They help with critical needs of domestic violence survivors and advocate for legislative change to help combat domestic violence. Again, I thank you for all of your support in joining us for this year's 2020 Mayor's Walk Against Domestic Violence. And if there's anyone out there that is seeing this and you are in an abusive relationship or know someone that needs help, please know that there's help out there. Call Sister Care Domestic Violence Hotline at 803-765-9428 and get the help that you need. Thank you again and let's all take steps to end domestic violence. Hello, Columbia. I thank all of you for your support to raise awareness about domestic violence and helping support victims in our community. As you've heard from Councilwoman Devine, there's still so much work that needs to be done in our community and especially across the country. Recently, the Violence Policy Center reported that South Carolina ranks 11th in the nation and the rate of women murdered by men. This is the first time in the 27 year history of the study that South Carolina has not been in the top 10. While on its face, it may be a positive sign, it doesn't tell the whole story. Since 2014, the rate of women being murdered by men has increased by 19% nationwide. And South Carolina's dismal rank of fifth last year would have ranked 10th in the most recent study. This year has added to the many challenges we already face on a daily basis. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, calls for help in relation to domestic violence have increased nationwide and in our community. It's so important that we continue to spread the message of hope to all our, of our citizens and reassure them that we're here for them and we're ready to help at any moment. Again, I thank you for all that you've done in our community to speak out against domestic violence, but please know that our efforts don't just end today or this month. We must continue to fight against the census violence, and I'm proud to fight along with you. Thank you, and Godspeed. This year, the COVID-19 crisis has created a uniquely challenging situation for advocates and an exceptionally dangerous situation for victims of domestic violence. 
increased economic hardship and unnecessary restrictions on travel have amplified the risk of harm for those who are in close and more frequent proximity to their abusers, meaning that most victims have lost access to those precious few moments where they could find an opportunity to seek help during work or school hours. So, as the pandemic goes on, how can we make sure to support survivors and make change in our city and state's relationship with domestic violence? What are all the pieces needed to bring peace to the homes in our communities and the individual survivors seeking to find safety and healing? First, we must accept and acknowledge that domestic violence is not simply a criminal justice problem. This is clear in the fact that during normal times, only about half of domestic violence crime victims call the police. We will never make significant and long-term progress if we don't change our mindset on our approach to one that addresses all of its manifestations as an economic, a public health, a community, and a human rights problem. Second, we must widen our view when it comes to policy and programs. There are so many factors that impact the underlying causes and cyclical nature of intimate partner violence, including housing, systemic racism and inequity, food insecurity, and other societal pressures, instances of which have been magnified throughout this health crisis. Lack of access to affordable housing, comprehensive paid leave, affordable health care and child care means a victim's ability to escape an abusive situation is greatly diminished. As a society, we have to think in bolder ways to develop comprehensive survivor-centered solutions and policies. Too often we become boxed in by what is believed to be politically feasible. It is time for the scope of what is possible to become much, much wider. For as the poet Lucille Clifton said, we cannot create what we cannot imagine. Third, we must better engage the community. In every situation where domestic violence occurs, the community is impacted. We must intentionally create opportunities for connection within our own communities and also ensure that all victims have access to the services and resources they need, including emergency shelter, support, and civil legal assistance. What is occurring right now behind closed doors in homes across Colombia, perhaps even next door to you, is affecting all of us, whether or not we are able to see it. While we focus on the impact of the pandemic, the impact of domestic violence continues and we will experience the repercussions for months, years, and even for decades into the future. So today, ask yourself, what is your piece? What is your part to play in ending domestic violence? How does it fit into the picture of collective action that will solve this urgent issue? We must all act now to bring about the robust necessary investments in prevention, pathways to healing and support to create a safer community in which no one fears violence from someone they love. This walk is a beginning, but the path is long and we must commit to move forward every day until we reach our goal. It started out pretty normal. Um, we had, he was older than me in school, so I really didn't know him. And we had run into each other um, at the township and um, started talking and went out a few times and um, I knew you know some people that he was associated with who were good people and um, so we we started dating and it was probably probably close to six months before it started getting really weird um, and I tried to back out gracefully. And um, I've always heard this saying, it's easier to stay than it is to leave. And that's very much the case. Um, I would get threats to kill my dad um, and hurt my family and, and things like that. So it, it kind of gets you in a position where, you know, I'm not living with, with them, I can't watch them all the time, and, and you're afraid to tell your family because A, you're gonna be judged, and then I, don't, I didn't want him going and looking for him and, and any trouble getting started. And so it, it 
it's, it, when it comes on, it comes on fast and hard, and then it's really hard to get out of. One night I was out with girlfriends having dinner, and he knew one of them and sent her a text with my dad's street sign. Um, so of course I jump up and run to my dad's house and without telling him what was going on, um, but wanting to know he was okay. It was a matter of three years. Um, and I had tried numerous times to, to back out and, and would send me subtle threats, but I knew what they meant. And um, it wasn't necessarily, I'm gonna kill your dad, you know, or, or things like that. It was, it was subtle and I knew what, what it meant. And it just, you cooperate and, and, and you do what you can to survive. And, and I think it was all a challenge to him and, and um, to break me down. And, um, and he did, because I'm not, I'm not scared of very much, but I'm, I'm scared of him still. I moved and I would take the long way home or you know, switch routes every single day because um, he had ways of getting other vehicles or having someone follow me. And, um, and so it was, it was I, I did that for a long time and sometimes I still find myself doing it and it's been almost six years. And um, sometimes I'll just get uneasy for no reason and, and then I start you know, watching everything and and on high alert, but um, but I just stayed with them, and then I reached out to Sister Care. I have 26 police reports. One of those is actually where he choked his ex-wife after I had left, um, and like I said, he he remarried immediately, and um, and it wasn't long. To, I mean, he he beat her bad. And um, he had choked her one night when they were out, and someone else called the police. And he went to jail and um, managed to get out. And all the charges are gone now. And I don't know how any of that happens. So my goal is to take that and make a difference and make domestic violence laws tougher. Sister Care gave me everything I needed because I sure didn't get it anywhere, anywhere else when I went for help. I had family support and friend support, but legal support, I didn't, I didn't have very much of that. And Sister Care, Dr. Ross was there the whole time and, and was wonderful. Dr. Ross had met with me and she even came in on a Sunday and um, she did a danger assessment. And I believe the score is eight whenever um, the victim starts dying, when they start killing them. And I scored a 30. So they empowered me and, and reminded me, you know, that, that I can do this and that I, I can stand back up because you, you do feel it's debilitating, you know, the fear the shame, everything is debilitating. And they reminded me that I needed to stand back up and, and, um, and that I had support and any, anything that I needed, attorney, everything, they were all there. And um, I know, I don't know, I would hate to think of where I would be without them. So peaceful. <laughs> I mean, really, for the most part, everything is just so peaceful because um, it there's constant eggshells with the abuser. You're you're constantly walking around and trying to figure out what you can say and what you can't say because it, it changes from day to day, and um, just depending on their mood and if they want to fight, and um, and they can take the simplest of things. And so it's just so peaceful and wonderful and like I said I still get nervous now and then but um, and I can't explain why but um, 
for the most part, I, I wouldn't, I would not go back for anything. I wouldn't change anything. I, I would, anyone, anyone that's in it, and once you get out, you have to deprogram yourself when you leave um, because you feel so defensive because you've been defending yourself for however long you were in the relationship. And, um, and so you have to deprogram all of that and, and um, realize that you don't have to do that anymore. And that's a sense of freedom. I call July 19th, 2015 my Freedom Day. Um, because that's when I went completely no contact with anyone, everything remotely associated. I can't, I can't even imagine um, because my, my getaway, my runaway was work or even going to the grocery store or w whatever I could do for a few minutes. I mean, you, you knew you had to get everything done quickly um, or there would be a fight when you got back. You, you had to go to work and come straight home and, and, um, and things like that, but I can't, I can't even imagine having to be there all the time. I mean, even sometimes at work, I would just sit at my desk and work and cry, but it was a release. And, um, and I can't imagine that desperately need to reach out and call sister care. Call and get help and get out. Especially with, with, if you have children there. And, because that's the worst case scenario. Never stop speaking out and never stop standing up because they hear you. They hear you. And it does make a difference.